Well, thank you for the, first of all, thank you for the, the invitation to this astonishing city. Um, what I'm going to describe is, this is joint work with Asnif Kasparian in Sofia, whom I have never met. Um, and um, I've actually written another paper with somebody I never met, but I'm examining his PhD next month, so I shall meet him then. Um, and um, it goes back, really, to um, kind of quite an old problem. Um, so let me, let me explain the, um, the background. So this is very well known to a lot of people here. But so for, uh, several of you can um, sort of close your eyes and get over your jet lag for a little while. Uh, but um, I don't want to lose half the audience immediately. So let me, let me do a bit, of, uh, a bit of explaining about this. So what very often, you, you very often find yourself in the following situation in algebraic geometry. Um, so I'll start with um, G. Um, <coughs> which is um, a, I want it to be non-compact, semi-simple, well, Lie group, but I really want to think of it as a, um, uh, as a real um, linear algebraic group. So, um, Okay, and so associated with this, um, I have um, a quotient by some maximal compact subgroup, connected maximal compact subgroup, I suppose. Um, so this is a symmetric space. And then G still acts on this from the left. Um, and um, we're interested often, and I'll explain what I mean by often in a minute. Um, most people here know this, but never mind. Um, so we're often interested in um, X. So this is the thing I'm really interested in, um, which is something of the form um, D modulo some gamma, where gamma is a subgroup of G, and it's a lattice, so it's a discrete subgroup, and it is um, of finite co-volume. So I've, I mean, this has Haar measure on it, and um, then I take the quotient G, G mod gamma, and that should have uh, finite co-volume, so where um, is a lattice, i.e. a discrete subgroup of finite co-volume. Okay, so this is still a bit too general for me. Um, because I want to think about the cases that actually occur in, um, in algebraic geometry, which is what I'm really interested in. Um, so, um, in algebraic geometry, usually, if not always, um, D is Hermitian, so we have um, some sort of complex structure around. Um, and this happens uh, there's a nice 
condition when, but that, that tells you when this happened, and it happens exactly when the center of G is not a discrete group. So this doesn't particularly, it, I don't particularly care when it actually happens because, and it happens in general because uh, what I'm really interested in is these things just turn up um, in the course of doing algebraic geometry. Um, but I'm going to try and state things in as much generality as I can, um, even though it's going to be particular cases that really, that really uh, motivate me. Okay, and in that case, um, so D is a smooth, it's a complex manifold. Um, but the quotient um, is, in fact, a quasi-projective variety. Okay, so that's not obvious. Um, it's, um, um, I've taken a quotient by a discrete group, so I'm going to be not too far off having a complex manifold here, the x, but there could be some fixed points, so there can be some singularities. Um, that doesn't bother me so much. Um, the more difficult part is where did this algebraic structure come from suddenly because uh, no, up to here I've been dealing entirely, I mean this is very much an analytic object. Um, it's a, you, know, you think of this as being, for example, this might be something like the upper half plane or the Ziegel upper half plane, ball, something like that. So it's, um, it's not at all a, um, an algebraic object and now I take this quotient and suddenly something algebraic jumps out at me. Why is that? Um, okay, so, um, so this is not supposed to be obvious, although it's very well known to a lot of people here, but it still isn't obvious. Um, so what do we need? Um, I need a, um, I need a, an ample um, line bundle on x, and I'm going to get that by looking at the modular forms for this group gamma. So those are um, holomorphic functions on D with some sort of almost invariant behavior under gamma with some sort of co-cycle condition. Um, I'm not going to go into the details because either you already know the details um, or they're not very illuminating just to see written up. Um, but um, we need um, an ample line bundle on X and this is the bundle. I'm not going to worry too much about exactly what I mean by that of modular forms. For gamma. So I'm being a little bit hazy about exactly which bundle this is because I should specify the weight. And, um, so, um, the, um, so I can go on a little bit further. I mean, this gives me a quasi-projective variety, and I'd like to look at the corresponding projective variety. So, um, we could look at the, the graded ring of all modular forms and I take proj of it. Okay, and this I'm going to call x star. So this is automatically a projective variety um, is X star, and this is the Bailey Burrell compactification. Okay. Right, well, the Bailey Burrell compactification is a projective variety, um, but it's unpleasantly singular. Um, 
typically um, I've added something of very high co-dimension at infinity, and that's usually going to give me very bad singularities. Um, so I want to take some sort of um, resolution. Um, I don't absolutely need to take a smooth resolution, something with much milder singularities will do. And so um, I'm going to choose um, a resolution um, with at most finite quotient singularities, and that's good enough for everything I'm going to say. I don't need it to be smooth. Okay. So this is a very common situation, and of course one wants to do this in a controlled way. Um, and um, so toroidal compactification which I'm going to talk about in more detail, does that for you. Okay, okay so that's um, the, uh, the setup. And what I want to do is, uh, well, so there are some examples that one knows. Um, again, Many of them very well known to a lot of people here. Um, so, um, um, well, the ones that I think probably most of us are interested in are moduli spaces of, for example, abelian varieties K3 surfaces and so on. Okay. Plenty of other examples. Um, uh, okay, I want to um, just exclude one other uh, sort of stupid thing, which is that the conditions that I wrote up uh, didn't actually um, exclude the possibility that this X is already compact. Um, and I don't, I, I don't want to think about that case. Okay. Right. Um, I mean, of course, these aren't really moduli spaces a priori. I mean, D is typically the period domain for something. So you, it only becomes a moduli space if you know a Torelli theorem. But even so, this is not too bad. OK. Right, so here are some, here are some questions. Um, so question zero um, is which... Varieties arise this way, let's say by rationally, since I didn't pick a particular compactification. Okay, so that's the sort of most general question you could ask, and um, that's far too difficult. Um, and not really going to make us, we're nowhere near making any kind of attempt to answer that. So, um, if we're not going to be able to decide exactly which varieties arise, uh, let's at least look at some of the invariants that such a variety would have and see what we can say about them. So, um, question one is. Can we calculate the fundamental group? And by this I mean the topological fundamental group. I mean, X bar has some orbifold points, so I could also ask about the orbifold fundamental group. 
that's not what I'm doing. I'm really thinking of this as a, um, a complex analytic space, and I'm really asking about the topological fundamental group. Um, I'll explain in a moment why this isn't a completely stupid thing to do. Um, and then just you know, further questions one could ask. Um, question two um, is, um, um, can we calculate the Kadara dimension? Um, and then question three um, is um, just a more specific thing. Suppose we're in the case where X is actually a surface. Do we get all the The Enriquez classes. Can you, for example, give me um, one of these, you know, find me a G and a gamma um, so that uh, what comes out at the end is, um, say, a honestly elliptic surface or something like that, by rationally. Okay, so, I mean, I tend to talk about, I probably spend most of my time thinking about this question, question two, um, and I'm going to think about I'm going to talk about this one today and maybe say a little bit about that, although I don't think we've got very far with that yet. Okay. Right. So this is not the first time I have dealt with this question. Um, the, um, um, in fact, it's about the fourth. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of history as I go along. Um, uh, not you, you know all this history. Or, um, okay. um, Oh, I think the other thing I'm not going to think about is the case of dimension one curves. Um, the, um, I mean, there are still interesting questions you can ask, um, but um, the fundamental group is determined by the genus, and so there's no, uh, no, no particular interest in, that, in this aspect. Okay. Okay. Okay, so... Um, section two, which might actually be the only other section, depends how I decide to organize things. Like that. Okay, so the first thing is that um, this does actually make sense. Um, so I didn't say what this compactification was. I just said it's a compactification with quotient singularities. I could resolve those singularities if I want to. And... Um, you might worry that if I chose a different compactification, I would change the fundamental group. Um, as long as I remembered to choose this compactification to be normal, um, that doesn't happen. Okay. So, um, um, so pi one um, is an invariant. Um, uh, is a birational invariant. Let me say. among normal um, projective varieties. With quotient singularities. Um, that's not really obvious, even if I insist on smooth. There's still some work to be done. Um, and that much was the smooth case was dealt with by Armstrong around a long time ago. Um, and then the uh, observation that quotient singularities don't affect the fundamental group, um, it seems to be due to 
Janos Kollar, um, sometime, when was it? Um, that sort of time. Um, I mean, no, neither of these things is extremely hard, but there's a bit of work to be done in both cases. Okay, so at least I've asked a, say, uh, I've asked a sensible question here. Um, okay, well, the thing that's fairly clear um, and is quite easy to prove is that this, is, this group is going to be a quotient of gamma. Um, I mean, if it were not for the fixed points, then the um, fundamental group of x would be gamma. And then when you compactify, some loops in x are just going to disappear because you can, they, they acquire homotopies across the boundary. Um, so, um, so it is clear, again, there's a little bit of work to be done to check it, but it's not difficult. Um, it is clear that pi 1 of x bar is a quotient of gamma. And um, what we'd like to know is which one it is. So I think our first guess on the basis of calculations that people did, um, in, in particular in the abelian varieties case, in particular in the abelian surfaces case, so we're dealing with the, um, the Siegel up at threefold, Siegel modular threefolds, um, I think our first guess was that this would actually turn out to be trivial. Um, the first cases we found, um, the, uh, the fundamental group uh, was always trivial, and we began to suspect that that was actually what always happened. Uh, sorry? Yes, there are various. I mean, there's a certain amount of prehistory. As Canola, there was somebody called Heydrich. There's, there, there are three or four miscellaneous papers. So what those papers do, actually, that's worth saying this. So, I mean, there, there were before, I mean, even before this paper, was the, even before, before then in the 1980s and maybe even earlier, I think the first papers on this, I think, are in the mid-1970s. Um, and they calculate some particular cases. Um, and um, so the first few, they're just really specific cases, and then um, some that are a little bit less specific. Um, and the fundamental group always turned out to be trivial. And then I think uh, uh, Klaus and I did a couple more examples that we, where we actually wanted to know the answer, and those turned out to be trivial as well. And we began to suspect that this is because it was always trivial. And um, then I decided to have a think about it. Um, and um, so, um, um, so here's the result. So this is. me, but a long time ago. Um, if gamma is neat, which I'll explain in a moment, um, then pi 1 of x bar is gamma modulo or psilon. where epsilon is it's the normal subgroup of gamma generated by gamma intersect UP where P um, runs over, I didn't say this very clearly in the paper, so, but it runs over all semi-maximal, so there are some words to explain here in a minute, semi-maximal p 
parabolic subgroups of uh, G. And, um, oh, I probably need slightly. Um, no, that's all right. Um, uh, oh, no, OK, I do need one more condition. Um, that a gamma rational okay. so this sounds alarming, but it's really quite simple. Um, and UP is the is the center of the unipotent radical of P. Um, so before I explain these words, though a good many of you know what these words mean, um, let me just state a corollary. For any finite group, G0, um, There exists G and gamma such that pi 1 of x bar is isomorphic to G naught. So any finite group, I'm not saying this group is always finite, but I can realize any finite group as um, one of these um, Uh, as, as one of these subgroups. Okay, so NEAT um, is um, what that means is it nearly means torsion free. Um, it means a bit more than torsion free. It means that the you you look at the think of take, take some represent some faithful representation of gamma. I don't mind which one. You look at the subgroup generate the subgroup of C star generated by the eigenvalues of all the elements of gamma. And um, if that's torsion-free, uh, then you say the group is neat. So it doesn't have eigenvalues that are non-trivial roots of unity. Okay. Neat. Um, means that. So in particular, of course, it's not torsion. Um, sorry? Uh, not non-trivial. In which case, I can indeed choose x bar to be smooth. Um, but, um, yeah, except I mean, of course, what you say is right, um, but I just, all I did was to say that I take some model, uh, I mean, I can choose, I haven't specified that X bar is a toroidal compactification yet, so I'd be willing, at the moment, I'm still willing to resolve singularities. Um, um, yeah, I mean, the, uh, but I mean, I know the action, the, um, uh, I mean, I start off with this. Um, I mean, this one tells me, uh, you know, this tells me about the parabolic, ma maximal parabolic subgroups of G. So it's telling me, I mean, everything is determined by which subgroup of G it is, because it act, what the thing it's acting on is the um, symmetric space associated with G. Can you have the same gamma in the Yes, but epsilon depends on these parabolic subgroups of G. So it's not, you know, this doesn't, it depends on more than the isomorphism class of gamma, yes. Uh, 
I'm sorry? The, in the normal subgroup. Uh, okay. Essentially, yes. I mean, the reason, so semi by semi-maximal, what I mean is, um, uh, so if, if, G were, if G were simple, it would just be saying that it's, um, um, th that it's maximal, um, the, a maximal parabolic. In the, um, if, it's pro if it's only semi-simple, then I want it to be, in each factor, I want it to be either everything um, or a, a maximal parabolic. That's what I mean by semi-maximal. Um, and yeah, I mean, these, these turn up because they're the ones that correspond to boundary components in the um, bailey borel compactification. So that's where this comes from. Um, gamma rational means that this, um, in, this intersection should be, a, should be a lattice. In other words, it should be as big as possible. Um, it's not just some tiny little bit that happens to intersect. And again, that's the condition. That, so these are the right ones to look at. They, those are the things which give you the boundary components. Okay. Right. Um, okay. Uh, oh. that was right. um, uh, so semi-maximal um, uh, means maximal or everything in each simple factor. Okay, so, um, I mean, this is reasonably satisfactory, but um, in general, when we work with these things, gamma is not neat, it's just some group that we have to live with. Um, and um, it would be nice to know more. It would be nice to know some detail about what happens um, if, um, if gamma is not neat. Incidentally, let me just comment that um, I haven't specified in here that gamma should be an arithmetic group. Um, so um, in, in, in 1996, I did have to specify that gamma was an arithmetic group because the, um, at, at that point, uh, the toroidal compactifications, which I am using here in order to establish the existence of these, well, in order to, because the, the, the proof of this goes by looking at toroidal compactifications. So I needed toroidal compactifications to make this work. Um, the situation in 1996 was that toroidal compactifications had only been got to work for arithmetic groups, but there are these very few cases where you have lattices that are not arithmetic, the, 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 the uh, sort of de Limoster stuff, and um, sometime around um, in the early 2000s, um, Mock worked out the details for what happens if you don't restrict yourself to arithmetic groups, and this still works, uh, everything still works fine. You, don't, you don't, actually literally don't have to change anything. Um, so the, I hadn't realized this, it was, um, uh, it was uh, um, Asnif Kaspari, my co-author, who pointed this out to me. Um, this is of some interest, given that we wanted to think about surfaces, and some of the, there are surfaces that arise that way. Okay. Um, okay. Um, okay. So, so what if gamma is not neat? Um, what can we say? So if gamma is not neat, um, I can certainly see some more elements of the kernel of the map from gamma to um, pi on x bar, um, namely, Um, I had a notation for this, but it's the things that have a fixed point in um, 
Um, did I have notation for this, or did I not in the end? Um, okay, well, uh, namely, um, So if you actually have a fixed point on D, then um, it's quite easy to see that um, uh, that that is uh, that, that that element of gamma will correspond to something trivial in the fundamental group. Though actually, I think when we, I mean, we wrote this down in um, in one of our papers, and I think we must have done that because we couldn't find it written down in the literature anywhere. But um, I think Valerie wrote it down for us, but, we, but anyway. Um, so um, I mean, this must have. Been, this is kind of. It's kind of obvious, but it's. It, it's it, there's no real work to be done. It's just a remark. Okay. So. Um, right. um, so my statement. So what I'm going to do now is. Um, I'm going to state the, so what I would like to do today is to tell you exactly what that kernel is. Um, so I want to do this, I want to say, to say this in sort of Lee theoretic terms. Um, and, um, okay. So, I mean, the thing is that what you're, the way you should think of this is, so you certainly lose anything that's got fixed points on D, but you should also lose things that have fixed points at infinity. And what we've done is to think a bit more carefully about what it means to have a fixed point at infinity. I mean, a toroidal compactification isn't really a global quotient. It's lots of local quotients stuck together. Um, so one has to be a bit careful about what this actually means. And so here is the, um, 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 so I'm, I'm now going to assume um, that G is actually simple, and that's just because it's going to be easier to write things down. So that's, I'm assuming, simp I'm assuming simplicity for simplicity. It's not really, not really vital. Sorry? Sorry? Yes. It's, exactly. For simplicity, I'm assuming, I'm assuming simplicity for simplicity, because if it's only semi-simple, it's more complicated. But it's only more complicated to write. It's not more. It, it, it doesn't really make any difference. So I'm now talking about maximal. I then I don't have to keep saying semi-maximal as well, just maximal parabolics. Okay. Okay. Right. Um, so. Um, so I, I'll, I'll take. Um, a maximal parabolic P. Um, um, it's unipotent radical is NP. Um, and then this has a, a complement in, um, so I'm just trying to chalk. Um, and so this, you know, this fits into a, an exact sequence and the complement splits and the complement um, LP, so this is a Levy subgroup, this is a reductive group. Uh, sorry? Yes. And the, Right. Um, so this being, and then um, LP also splits, um, and it splits into um, a torus AP, 
and a semi-simple part. MP. Okay, so I'm now in a position to tell you what the result is. Um, Uh, at the moment, yes. That's one of the simplifications brought about by simplicity. Um, uh, it isn't going to matter anyway. Um, the um, let me make let me make the statement, and I think you'll this. You should see this go away in a moment. Okay. So theorem. Okay. Okay, so lambda is the well I'll say normal subgroup, but actually it's automatically normal. And it's generated by all the elements of gamma such that for some p, in other words, at some boundary component, so these are maximal, p is a maximal, um, maximal parabolic, and gamma rational and so on. Um, so, uh, for, for some p, I have, well, gamma should be in the, the Levy part, but it's not the whole of this either. Um, if I some power of gamma, so this is why I don't really care about finite index, some power of gamma um, is in AP. Okay. Actually, I think if I write this for, it, it, I think actually with the, um, I probably actually I've probably misled you slightly here because I think I probably only need this M um, if um, I'm deal if I go back to the semi-simple case. I think for, uh, for simple I may not need it. I'm not quite sure about that actually off the top of my head. Um, okay, and then pi one of x bar is gamma modulo. Sorry the product of those two. So these are the things, so I'm, what I'm doing here is I'm telling you, um, I'm telling you in Lie theoretic terms, which are the elements that have fixed points at infinity. Okay, so how much detail do I want to give? Um, I'd like to give as little detail as possible, really, because it's a mess. I mean, what you do is you write everything out. Um, hmm. Why do you require that gamma to be added to A P because it's real in the composition, but it's not. Why is this not gamma itself is A P? Um, So, if something is in the torus, 
So I think I probably need to say it like, I think, as I said, I think I may have um, misled you slightly by saying it like this, because my recollection is, and I should probably look at what we wrote exactly, um, that I probably only need this because of, um, uh, I, I pro I'm probably all right without the M um, if um, I'm dealing with simple. But I think, the, I, I think this M is a compromise that I have to put in for if I have only semi-simple. So I think when you... Um, um, so I think I've, you know, I think I've, in, in the process of simplifying it, I've actually... Don't uh, simplify. Sorry? Say uh, Yes, I suppose for what I've written here, I didn't need that. Uh, yes. Um, so this thing, if gamma is neat, then um, some power of it is in here. Um, actually, I mean, this is actually, uh, I, I convinced, so I convinced myself that um, if gamma was neat, then this would be, uh, the, the, then this would be the case, um, that, 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 that this group would indeed be trivial. Um, so, uh, if gamma, look, if gamma is not neat, then if I've got something, no, the way around it works is if gamma is not neat, so if I've got something which has, um, uh, which has some eigenvalues that are, um, that are roots of unity, then I can find um, the right kind of parabolic so that this thing actually ends up being the identity, some power of it, because you go roots of unity. The other direction is actually not so completely clear to me. I mean, I've never really thought, I've never really been completely convinced that neat is exactly the right condition. I mean, it's enough to make everything smooth. I don't think, I've, so, so, I mean, the statement that one gets in the literature is that if gamma is neat, then one can choose a toroidal compactification which is smooth. I don't think that the converse is actually asserted anywhere. I don't think I know. Yes. Yeah. Oh, well, of course, smooth. No, 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 yeah, because then you've got two torsion. No, okay, smooth in the, the uh, yeah, okay, no, of course that's, uh, no, no, okay, two torsion, so quasi-reflections, of course, give you, don't give you singularities, but, um, okay, but, but um, let, so let me say that slightly more carefully, because it's not actually singularities I'm interested in from that point of view, it's whether there are fixed points, whether there are, you know, whether there's branching. Um, so, neat is certainly enough to prevent branching, and therefore, a fortiori to prevent singularities. Um, I don't think that I have seen anywhere an assertion of converse, although it's the sort of thing that I kind of tend to think, or tended to think. But I think that the correct statement is actually this one. Um, I think this is telling me when, um, when there are... Um, because if I, have, if I have branching, then the elements that are causing the branching should disappear in this fundamental group. So I think that this is actually probably, I mean, neat is a good condition from the point of view of representation theory. It's easy to check. This is an unpleasant condition to check, because you have to take your group to pieces. Um, so, um, but I don't, as I said, I was kind of under the, I was kind of loosely under the impression that, um, uh, apart from this thing about um, quasi-reflections, that neat corresponded to um, no singularities, but I, I actually think that's probably not right, and I, I haven't found in the, in the literature anywhere a statement that just because you do not have singularities in that extended sense, you have to have a neat group. Okay. okay, how much detail do I want to give about this? I want to give as little detail as I can about this because it's actually really quite tedious. Uh, the, um, um, so...
So the, the proof consists of writing out masses of detail of toroidal compactification. Um, so, um, I mean, what do I have to do? Well, the first thing is, if I have, so, so really the difficulties, so, uh, okay, no, I was, I was, um, so really what I need to do is I need to, uh, so, so the, this is, uh, I'm now thinking of this one as a toroidal compactification. So I've got these patches that cover it, indexed by these p. And what I want to do is to find out when I have um, a fixed point in one of those patches. Now, of course, fixed point in one of those patches means um, up to the equivalence given by the gluing, but actually it goes away. Um, so. Let me make this assertion, first of all. Yes, I think I did write this here. Okay. Uh, but, uh, sorry, where did I write this down? So what I really want to know then is I'm going to kill off this, um, uh, this, um, well let me go back and explain briefly uh, why why that's true. Well, the reason why that's true um, is that um, you construct x bar u, um, which is A compactification of d modulo epsilon. So epsilon isn't an arithmetic, isn't a um, uh, uh, isn't a lattice anymore in general. I mean, this is just some subgroup of gamma, and it could be quite small. Um, but it's still a discrete group. It's not got finite finite volume anymore. But you can still go through while well, compactifying, and um, the, you can still go through the toroidal compactification procedure. I mean, I can still um, I can still take the um, I, I can I can still add some stuff at infinity, and I get some sort of rather unpleasant looking big object. But the thing is that this is simply connected, and um, what still acts on it is that there. So this is this is like a toroidal compactification, except that I've taken a group that's way too small. So I get a space that's way too big, but I don't care. I mean, I'm all its, it's purpose in life is to be the universal covering space. Um, and so what I want to do is I want to understand the. Um, um, so I'm. So what am I doing here? I'm taking a, a quotient by uh, gamma modulo epsilon and then lambda. So what I want to know is if I go as far as, um, sorry, I've just, sorry, I think just my notation here is, is broken, I think. Oh yes, okay. So what I want to do uh, 
um, is I want to understand when gamma epsilon has a fixed point in, in here. So this is some coset. So I take some element. I'm, I've, I've killed off, essentially killed off epsilon already. Um, and so I want to know when do other things have fixed points. And so the first thing, um, um, the first thing is that here I'm looking at the, um, at the fixed points of some coset, but actually I can, with a little bit of effort, I can go back up and look at the action of gamma on, um, well, it doesn't, on some, ex at least locally on some extension of D. I mean, I can find some piece of the toroidal compactification, and this is covered by um, a piece of um, D with some extra stuff on it, some, with some boundary components. So I, I, take, I take D, and remember how toroidal compactification works. Um, I take D, typically I take D, I add some boundary component to it. I take an open neighborhood, Hausdorff open neighborhood, of that boundary component, and I take a quotient of that, and then that's a, that's a piece of the, um, uh, of the toroidal compactification near some boundary component. Um, and so what you would hope is that um, things that have a fixed point in here would show up as things which, the, the, if I choose the, the right element in this coset, I can actually make it have a fixed point on the nose in D extended in some way by some, you know, according to some toroidal boundary component. Okay. Um, so let me just say that in the, in the slightly approximate way that I have said it. Um, so we can assume um, that gamma actually uh, acts, uh, actually, let's say, has a fixed point um, on some boundary component of D. So I really am back to elements with fixed points. So in other words, I'm going to be able to look at things one component at a time. Um, and then once I've done that, um, this is, which is sort of slightly tiresome, but not, uh, not, really, not really difficult. So I take D, I add some boundary component, um, some rational boundary component, and then gamma preserves. Gamma is in the stabilizer of that component, and it has a fixed point. Um, and then... Um, What do I want to say? Um, how much time have I got? I've got no time. OK, well, that's good, because I don't really want to go on doing this too much longer. Um, so that picks out a, a, I mean, that's picked out a, a parabolic subgroup for me. What I do then is I decompose that parabolic subgroup. Um, according to, you know, into a levy factor and then into a torus part and semi-simple part. Um, and um, you simply write out all the detail of the local construction, factor by factor. I mean, this, so, so the thing is that this decomposition, um, so that, let's say, That picks out a parabolic Q, um, and um, let's just say it this way. The local structure um, 
is given by coordinates um, reflecting you know, the thing that Q is, and then you know it's NQ dot uh, LQ, which is NQ dot, and then uh, MQAQ. Yeah. So I, lift, I, I write out what happens, and then this MQ, that's got the, this, there's, a, there's this other VQ. That, that, I mean, you just write, you, you, essentially you spend hours um, going through Ash, Mumford, Rappaport, and Ty until you find the right page. Um, and then you discover that one of you is using the old edition and one of you is using the new edition. So you, you make a dictionary of which page in the old edition corresponds to which page in the new edition. Eventually, you find the right thing, um, and it all works out. The, um, the thing that's perhaps a little more difficult, so in, and, and then you, know, you, you just write down what it means for gamma to have a fixed point, and um, it, it drops out. I mean, you the things, things that are zero should be zero, and you end up in here somehow, it ends up in here. The thing that's perhaps a little more difficult is the other direction. If you've actually got, um, if I've actually got some element um, that satisfies these conditions, how do I know it's got a fixed point? And the reason it's got a fixed point is somewhere, it, 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 it preserves some, uh, you know, it lives in some parabolic, so it preserves that. And then in the toroidal compactification, you have a cone. In the construction of the toroidal compactification, you have a cone. And what you want to do is you need to find a fixed ray for your gamma inside that cone. And essentially, that tells you which direction to go to infinity in, in order to find the fixed point at infinity of the element you're looking at. And finding that fixed ray um, is slightly delicate. I mean, the reason it... Um, um, the, um, that's the last thing I'll say, possibly not even right, um, but the, um, um, oh, let me just say what I said. Uh, conversely, if gamma these conditions then it fixes a ray. I mean, the point really is that this AQ, this is real torus, and the real torus that it is, is the, um, um, uh, is essentially that cone, um, which is an R star to the something. It fixes, a, well, it's part of it. It fixes a ray in um, the cone or a cone, the cone corresponding to a boundary component. So I've been very vague. A boundary component, um, which, uh, let's just say, points the way a fixed point at infinity. I mean, this kind of thing is, it, it's, it's, um, it's difficult to talk about because you can either write out everything, which is basically what we do, uh, or you can wave your hands like this, but there's kind of no middle ground. Um, you, you either write out all the details or you write out no details. So this is a talk, so I've written out no details. Uh, so I'll stop there.